just to give you a quick background, um, this is what I will be discussing this afternoon. The Northwest University of South Africa boasts with about 65,000 students for 2014. Of these, more than 37,000 were contact or on-campus on students and more than 28,000 were distance or off-campus students. Currently, the university has a staff corps of 4,130 FTEs. Campuses are distributed uh, across two provinces, um, ranging from 60 to 100 miles apart. The three campuses have roughly 248 classrooms between them, so obviously end goal, 248 classrooms fitted with capture agents. Um, but this should, all, this should give you a, a good idea of the size of the shop. In a country with 11 official languages, one will find a li linguistic diversity very few universities in the world could compare to. For the sake of inclusivity of, um, of all students, the Northwest University of South Africa had come up with a live translation service in a number of classes. Logical progression with the implementation of a lecture capture system was to include the translation in the normal recorded lectures. This meant configuring both capture agents as well as Matteron workflow to handle the second audio stream. Currently in our pilot environment, we have the following. Uh, the last two items on the list came very late in our pilot phase. I shall elaborate on this a bit later. All of this is on a distributed file system. Changes have been made to the code so that the files will, will not be continuously downloaded and uploaded as the initial code intended. Um, the file gets downloaded once into the workspace directory, all the work gets done on the worker node, and when all processing is done, it gets uploaded back. The planned architecture for our rollouts of OpenCast Matron, sorry, I all wrote my speech before this became public knowledge. <laughs> so. Um, our planned rollout for OpenCast Matron in 151 in July. Uh, this means a bit of a redesign in our architecture. Um, so we are looking at the following. One admin server, two ingest nodes, two worker nodes, an infinite amount of worker nodes in the form of capture agents when the need arises, uh, one engage server, one solar server, one DB server, HA proxy load balancer, and two Nginx servers for after the fact uh, viewing. Or, and also one engine server for live stream viewing or broadcasting. In terms of hardware, due to space limitations inside the podium, we had to look at alternatives to normal desktop computers, uh, which take up a lot of space. So we ventured out and found the Lenovo Tiny M73 desktop. It is a 2 gigahertz i5 quad-core processor, 12 gigs of RAM for the sake of the worker node, and 500 gigs hard drive space. This seems ample for both capturing the lecture as well as encoding at night time. This ran us about $720 or 480 pounds out of pocket. With this, we have the Epifan VGA to USB frame grabbers, uh, which are roughly $329 each. And then for the translator's audio input, I used an $8 Astrum USB audio input device. I will tell you why. Well, this, although this is only mono input, um, it automatically converts it to stereo on hardware level, so we didn't have to go through any magic to get that done. Lastly, we implement, where possible, LG touchscreens. Uh, although with our self-service model, we are rethinking this due to the fact that we want to discourage manual recordings altogether because of the complexity of getting them published to the correct series. The screens, however, cost about $250, which gives you a total cost of hardware in the vicinity of £875. The model chosen from the start was a lecturer self-service model versus a centralized administration. Um, this was mainly due to the fact that sufficient resources will not be made available uh, for centralized administration and therefore it automatically poses limitations on scalability. Full integration with an LMS, which in our case uh, Sakai, was totally a necessity. Thanks to the initial LTI code provided by UCT, we were able to, uh, to adjust it to fit our needs for, for full automation. This is the administration page the lecturer will find on their Sakai site, um, which 
all of you can see resembles uh, the, the Matron open cast admin page. The scheduled recordings, uh, the, the lecturer can then use this scheduling tool um, for his or own recordings with lecture titles of their choice. As you can see, um, as, I, as I've stated, this is exactly as it is found on the, on the admin UI of OpenCast. Uh, the videos that are published to Sakai are only visible to the students who are enrolled for that specific module. This is due to the way that the LTI uh, is implemented with, with open costs. Every five minutes a script runs to get all the sites from Sakai's DB um, and update the series field in, in the Matron DB accordingly. By then using the series ID in the tool, we limit the people who can directly view this video from Sakai. We've also picked up a very old CAS uh, module for the NGINX which we, are, we, which we basically had to recompile from scratch to get it working. This is, however, still in its infancy um, and, and definitely still a work in progress. This ensures that intellectual property is not freely available for distribution directly from our servers. But of course, there's nothing one can do about a student downloading and sharing it on their own. So what did we do? Luckily, Gallicast is quite versatile, versatile out of the box and allows a fourth stream to be, to be recorded. We simply had to purchase the right hardware to capture the stream, ensure that the profile is selected correctly, and the translator audio was recorded by Gallicaster. In the Matron workflow, it was a bit different, though. Um, as most of you are well aware, Matron will, by default, encode the recordings in such a way that it will put the audio with both the presenter and the presentation camera feeds. We had to adapt the code so that it will encode the translator's audio file to the presentation video container, uh, leaving you with something similar to this. And just to give you a quick demonstration of everything that I've explained up to now, I'm going to try and play a video, and hopefully with me it will work. No, it won't, so I'll just do this. Sorry. Oh, there we go. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, and let me rather say, superheroes, welcome to this class. Remember, in the subject we learn how to be superheroes, because you are going to be able to draft the communication plan. So that was just a proof of concept that we did, um, but as you can see, it's quite usable. So for the next rollout, the new features. As stated already, that we are planning a 151 rollout in the July recess, and the following will be incorporated into this rollout. Bahia 4.0, sorry for all the Spanish-speaking people if that's not the correct pronunciation. <laughs> Because development for broadcasting capabilities are already taking place, we have decided to stick with the Paya player. Seeing that this player has already been around for a while, we have been able to get to the guts of it and start brainstorming about how we want to tackle the challenge of broadcasting live. Although there seems to be still quite a bit of work done, uh, needed to get done to get the streams directly from Gallicaster. The language button for online viewing um, will also be added to the player UI in order to allow the students to easily switch between the two language tracks where two tracks are available. Uh, the button has already been added, as you have seen, to the, to the normal engaged player, and the concept has been proven. Uh, even with the project in its infancy, we have already received feedback from students about the complex method 
of downloading files from the UI. Although our planned release of 151 features a composite workflow operations handler, it did not accommodate the second audio stream that we are recording. We had to adapt the code to have the second audio track present. Uh, the workflow simplified, of course, will look something similar to this. Our NGINX integration came in the form of HTTP pseudo streaming uh, rather than RTMP. When we started to look into this, we immediately saw that we may have some issues with Apple devices and RTMP. So we decided early on uh, that we will need to do HTTP pseudo streaming to accommodate all of the devices the, student, the students may use. Which brings us on to challenges. Um, as with any project, the single most popular word of uh, all of us here and on a continuous basis is scalability. This to me and I presume to a lot of you is more of a collective noun than we care to admit. Uh, this does not only entail how easy it is to get more of the same as the demand grows, but also cost effectiveness, optimal use and limited resource handling. One of the first scalability issues we ran into, which I think is quite common, was a great number of students trying to view the, the, the videos directly from the Engage server all at once. Uh, when the need arose, we decided we wanted to ensure that, that we don't run into the same issue in the near future, hence the two NGINX servers with an HA proxy load balancing in the front. This meant a rewrite of the URL um, by the Apache instance running on the engaged server. So now the student logs into Sakai, gets the media package URL from, from engage, um, but the actual video is then fed via HA proxy directly from the NGINX servers. Another issue, issue which I believe, uh, believe a, uh, sorry, another issue which I believe a lot of universities, but definitely not all of them, have when it comes to scalability is budget. Budget restraints is one of, is the one thing that gets the creative juices flowing in every person who has ever worked on a project that consists of more than five people. This common demon forced us to look at the following: one, which component can be multiplied to keep the turnaround time on video processing to a minimum? as the demand and usage grew? And two, what is the cheapest yet sane manner in which to do it? So we came up with the idea of a capture agent doubling up as a worker node at night. Initial studies showed that with the capture agents we are using, the only improvement we had to make was to up the amount of RAMs that it comes with from four gigs to 12 gigs, a cost implication of roughly 85 US dollars or 56 pounds. By doing a cost comparison to get a worker node with the following specifications, as seen there, one will find the following. For the capture agents, $85. For a virtual machine in a VMware environment, roughly $687. And Amazon will cost us in South Africa $191 US dollars per month if it is used for 24 hours per day and 16 gigs of data will flow both in and out. Another challenge is the availability of classrooms for installation. Um, due to space limitations, we have to more often than not wait for the recess in order to make the installations. Being roughly 100 miles from the closest city, Johannesburg, one has to ensure that the hardware one uses is e easily maintainable and readily available if needed to be replaced. Also being in South Africa, we cannot rely heavily on hardware which has to be sourced from outside the country. Um, as the import process can result in stock arriving late and you missing your due dates for installations, etc. Hence the fact that we compile our own capture agents, therefore making the capture agent a modular unit instead of a complete unit like an end cost um, makes more sense to us. Especially with the live translation service in mind, we had to make sure that whatever we use as an input device was readily available. The choice of using the Lenovo Tiny limited us to only USB sound cards. Um, and as with all hardware, you can go and choose to go all out and buy the most expensive equipment to ensure the best quality. But this option is once again not scalable to us. We settled on what we believe is a good enough quality to produce a video that is usable by the student. This hardware is also readily available in our town, so if a need, unit needs replacing, we can easily do so. Flip classroom is a term that most of you will be familiar with. I've heard them speaking about it earlier as well. Um, in our pilot phase, we've already had quite a few lecturers um, who go in and on a Saturday afternoon 
and record a whole term's worth of lectures beforehand and then tell the students they can go and watch it and use it as, as part of their preparation and the class will only be a discussion session. Um, one challenge that we seem to have with this is the fact that the translator will not be as keen to work on a Saturday afternoon as the lecturer. So <laughs> this might be something, uh, this might be quite a big problem and, and we can foresee some other problems <coughs> as well. So any ideas that anyone has, um, you are more than welcome to share them now or at the social events as we all know that those are usually the times that the, the most creative of ideas come around. Then right at the beginning with our implementation of, of OpenCast Matron, which was then still Matron, uh, 131, we ran into the issue where large files, normally larger than 3 gig, um, would result in engage internal server errors. The reason that we saw, or basically, the reason that we had the problem and it seemed like nobody else did is that the norm at our university's lectures are one hour and 50 minutes uh, instead of the 50 minutes which seemed to be the norm at that stage at other universities. Um, but due to the fact that Matron is open source software, our Java developer was able to get into the code and fix this for us quite, quite easily and that code has obviously gone with us since then. Um, large video sizes in, in output files because we serve a lot of remote sites with very little bandwidth, we came across the challenge of providing a feasible size video without jeopardizing the quality. Our rollout in June will hopefully see a new workflow where we only create MP4 files, but of different file sizes. This means creating a full 720p or up um, video for on-campus viewing or downloading, and then creating another MP4 with a, for the remote sites where the bit rates will differ a bit to create a smaller sized video. This is a huge challenge, as most of you are well aware. One of the biggest factors of, in lost recordings is power failures. We are still working on a solution for that. Uh, bad audio is, is another challenge that deserves a mention. And with this specific challenge, there's quite an extensive range of problems, which I will not delve into at the moment. Uh, just to sum it up, we classify bad audio as anything inaudible or unusable as in a video. For future development and ideas, as stated already, um, we are looking into broadcasting. This is a topic that has had uh, some traction for quite some time now. And although for some it might be a bit of a niche product, for, it's, for us it's actually a necessity. With campuses more than 100 miles apart, one encounters quite a few logistical issues if a specific class has to be given more than once in two or even sometimes three different locations. This puts a strain on the lecturer and also it's quite a big cost implication to the institution. So the possibility of broadcasting together with the option of having a second audio language track available on the remote side is something that we are pursuing with a lot of interest. The biggest challenge we are facing at the moment is how to get the streams directly from Gallicaster to the Nginx broadcasting and uh, we are hoping to find some collaborators on this. We've been thinking about how to speed up the processing time of videos. At this stage, we are very happy with it, um, with how long it takes to, to get the videos published. But as with everything in life, we always try to improve it. The idea that we are playing with is using GPU stacks to run the encoding jobs on all videos. Um, this, idea is, this idea, however, is still in its infancy and uh, no specific details has been discussed as of yet. And I thank you. So any questions, comments, or... Doesn't seem like it. That is also something that we have been um, thinking about. We actually have a whole department um, doing some research on text-to-speech. Um, 
the 11 official languages that you will find in South Africa, English is the only one known to the outside world or spoken in the outside world. So that is quite a, quite a focused sort of research that you have to do. With regards to transcription, um, general rule of thumb as far as I know is for every hour's worth of video, it will take about six hours worth of transcribing and then having to record it again. So we are looking into the native language called Afrikaans, the, the guys doing the research into that, um, to have it on the fly. But actually transcribing and recording a second audio source afterwards does not seem to be scalable again in, in our situation because you are going to have to put in a lot of man hours and then again your turnaround time on your videos will be, will be very long, um, especially if you have to do it throughout all of the classes. So the, the text-to-speech um, for, for the captions, if we, if we can pull it off to have the native one um, done on the fly a, as part of the workflow, then, then yes, we will, we will definitely, we are looking into that actually as well, or we go, are going to, to look into that. Um, Andrew Wilson, University of Manchester. So I've got a question about um, how you turn the capture agent to, into a, a worker at night. How do you do that? So basically the idea that we are fiddling around with is um, Gallicast already runs on Ubuntu and Matron, well, Opencast says you can use Ubuntu. So it's a cron job. Um, basically install the worker node profile on the capture agent itself um, and at 7 o'clock at night, most of the lectures will actually terminate. Um, you, can, you can go and build in some you know, intelligence into it to say, listen, if you see Gallicast is running, don't fire it up. And then if it's not running, fire it up tomorrow morning, 6 o'clock, stop the process um, and yeah, just start Gallicast again. I, I just want to clear up, this is, this is not really... Uh, it's, it's a nice scalability thing to have if you run into issues, which we think. Um, you're already putting the hardware there. It's a low-cost implication. Um, it's not going to be there for doing all the heavy lifting during the day when the, the lectures stream in um, throughout the day or the, the working day. But at night, they are just sitting there doing nothing. So might as well have them do something. Yeah, it's a cool idea. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. So in this, I have another question. How do you manage the NFS storage system to, you have to provide to the server, to the normal server of a worker, and you have to provide the NFS also to the Ubuntu system? Um, Otherwise, you couldn't use it as a worker. Okay. Yeah. As, as, as far as I know, sorry, I just huh? have to, to clear up, I'm not the main developer of ours. Um, <laughs> the guy who does all the main developing couldn't be here, so he sent me with all the details and said, you go and present that. But the, the, as, as far as I understand, uh, as far as I understand, basically what happens is that the whole job gets downloaded onto the worker node itself. Mm -hmm. Then it gets processed in the, in the workspace directory, that's where the distributed part comes in. It uh, gets worked on, and as soon as all the processing for that job has been done, it gets uploaded back onto the onto the, the shared system. I don't know if that make, makes any sense to you guys. Um, I can help out that uh, you simply, if you don't, you do not need to uh, use shared storage. You can use um, uh, yeah remote implementations of uh, the um, stor workspace, and then. Whenever you request a file, it will be loaded over HTTP. So it's not very performative, but it's. <coughs> but, but you know, it's it's optimized. So if this is all on shared. It it knows about it and it works it out itself, and it just just hard linking. So it's, it's optimized. Okay. There's another guy. Oh, 
Stuart, I've done my best to try and keep it in the time frame. <laughs> no, it, it's their fault if we go over. <laughs> I'm totally sorry for that. No, no. Uh, wait, one question that I have is uh, at the end of the day when you, or at the end of the night when you uh, stop the worker, you might have actually some jobs still running. So do you also check for these jobs and have some uh, overlapping time period where you say, okay, the job meets what? at max two hours, and so I check if jobs are running, and as soon as no jobs are running anymore, I'm stopping it? Or how do you manage that? The, the intelligence that I spoke about, one thing that, that we thought about was actually about an hour's time before we want to shut off the worker node is to put it in, into maintenance. Um, an hour, an hour and a half, depending on, on, on what the, 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 the job load is. So you put it into maintenance for it not to, to get any new jobs. Um, but just on that point, what I've actually gone and done previously is um, we gave a job to a worker node to do. And I took the, the capture agent's power and I just pulled it. While everything was running, I just pulled the power and left it. And the encoding job just got passed onto another worker node. It kept on working properly and the, the encoding was done totally. So even, even if you have a remote power failure or anything like that, it seems like it's quite robust in not losing the, the, the job queue and the, the, the workflow in total. Does it answer your question? Sorry. Okay. Yes. <laughs>